All right, so hello again, everybody. My name is Beth Ann Webster. I'm the Executive Assistant at Futures Recovery Healthcare. So on behalf of everyone, I wanna thank you all for joining us today. This is the fifth free virtual um, lecture event that we've been able to offer our professional community. So we're excited to be able to continue doing that. And I hope that you guys will join us for the next one. So with that, I am going to hand it over to Brandon Hamdorf, who is one of our outreach professionals at Futures, who has been a big part of putting this event together today. And he's gonna share a little bit more about what we do here at Futures and get us started. Thanks, Brandon. Thank you, Beth Ann. I'll go ahead and turn on my screen share here really quick. So bear with me one moment. And you guys should be able to see that now. Um, Beth Ann, thumbs up if that is good to go, awesome. Thank you guys uh, very much for taking the time out of your day to join us. Like Beth Ann said, for this lecture series, it is something that I am personally and professionally very passionate about. Um, and for those of you that don't know me, my name is Brandon Hamdorf. I am probably one of the newest members to the outreach team here at Futures, and I could not be happier to be part of the Futures family. Um, it, we are located in Tequesta, Florida and are on about nine and a half acres of a very beautiful, serene, calm, uh, engaging environment. Um, we are licensed to treat adults 18 and older that have a primary diagnosis of substance use disorder, co-occurring disorder, uh, and have primary mental health concerns. And as I'm going through this, I'm just gonna give you a quick inside peek as to our facility and give you an inside look. Um, so as you can see, this is the main entrance and our courtyard view right behind us. Um, as you can see, it is very calm, very quiet. We do offer a full continuum of care uh, at Futures and, and realistically pride ourselves on being very clinically driven. Um, we're very compassionate and have a very strong clinical medical wellness um, team all around that continually exceeds expectations when we're looking at treating patients that are coming to Futures. Um, we treat folks uh, where they are when they get to Futures and just have a really encompassing program throughout. And I, I've shown you some of the stuff around the property, but I really wanted to pause here for a second. Um, this is where Dr. Ahmed spends a lot of his time working with our patients that are in need of specialized pain programming. Um, and you'll get to hear more from him today during the lecture. Um, but a couple of the things that you did not see as we were just going through the property very quickly would be uh, our primary mental health program, which is completely separate. Uh, that is on the second floor of Futures. Uh, on the third floor, we have our concierge program called Orenda. Uh, we also have an adventure and experiential program called Rise. Uh, and within our core programming, we have some specialty tracks for first responders called Heroes Ascent. Uh, we have some specialty programming specific to individuals in need of more trauma-focused treatment. Um, and we also work with a specialized pain population here at Future. So, um, I now have the opportunity and the pleasure of introducing to you all uh, our Chief Operating Officer, Dr. Deja Gilbert, who holds a PhD. She is also an LMHC and an LPC. Uh, Deja has extensive experience in the behavioral health field, uh, and she would be considered, in my opinion, uh, the heartbeat of our clinical and professional excellence here at Futures. Uh, over the past six months, Deja has welcomed me into the Futures family, uh, and I could not be more grateful for her leadership and her authenticity. And I honestly, I couldn't have asked for a better leader. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Dr. Deja Gilbert. Thank you, and good morning. As Brandon mentioned, my name is Dr. Deja Gilbert, and I am the Chief Operating Officer here at Futures. And thank you, everyone, for joining us today. As many of you know, the field of mental health has come a long way over the last 50 years as we continue to learn more about the human body and the brain on a daily basis. Just a few short years ago, psychologists, psychiatrists, we were still referred to as shrinks and it was abnormal and shameful to address mental health needs. The mental health and substance abuse fields have experienced our own progressions and growth as we have begun uh, to be influenced more by research and evidence-based practices. Thankfully, this has led the way in reducing a negative stigma associated with mental health, although there is still much work to do. 
Here at Futures, we pride ourselves on pioneering the mental health and substance abuse field by employing evidence-based practices, challenging outdated beliefs and practices, while providing a springboard for our practitioners to research, develop, and implement philosophies and practices that are applicable to our societal needs. In today's segment of our webinar series, we're highlighting one of the pillars found within our treatment program. As our country continues to develop and implement procedures and laws that are aimed at addressing the opiate epidemic, we believe there's a portion of that continuum that has not been addressed su sufficiently within substance abuse and mental health. Pain has traditionally fallen under the medical umbrella. The science of pain, understanding the concept of pain and its many effects on the human brain and body, along with the psychosocial, familial, and community impact cannot be understated or ignored. The consumer has been inundated with information, much of which is outdated, some is false and completely inaccurate based off of myths, anecdotal remedies, and inaccurate information. Clients are left living in fear of how to address their pain while attempting to manage their mental health. Our society and medical structure has traditionally separated the two. Bridging the gap between mental health and medical care while utilizing pain is one of our main endeavors here at Futures. We see clients every day with pain, co-occurring behavioral health disorders, both leading to poor quality of life, impaired social and personal relationships, and an overall feeling of desperation. In today's discussion, Dr. Ahmed, who leads our team for our chronic pain patients, and our specialty programming will present on the science of pain and how it relates to the behavioral health care field and how we have utilized it here at Futures approaching healthcare in a progressive manner like leading this industry. So without fur further ado, I'm gonna transfer it over to Dr. Ahmed, welcome. All right, I think now you guys can hear me. Can everybody hear me? Sweet, awesome. Uh, welcome everybody, thank you for coming. I see we have a lot of people, this is pretty sweet. Uh, super grateful and appreciative. I think there's four pages, holy cow. Um, that is fantastic. If I have cursed, I apologize. I'm probably supposed to be super proper and professional, but sometimes I get really excited. So if I do, please forgive me. Um, I think we're gonna try to do a question and answer session at the end. Uh, if I don't talk too much, I'll try to talk as fast as possible so we can get some of those questions answered in there. But this topic is really, uh, I'm really passionate about it. It's it's a big part of us. It's been a big change in the both the medical field and in the substance abuse field, kind of what Dr. Deja was just talking about. So I'm gonna bring up my screen and but then if I just share it, will it go? Will I lose the video stuff or do I have to do, can I have both on? Yeah, we'll be able to see your, your screen, yourself talking. Sweet. Yep, just share it, yep. Oops. I know we practiced this yesterday, but. Boom. Can everybody see my screen? Yes, I did it right. All right. Fantastic. All righty then. All right. So if anybody has questions, I guess, you know, I don't want it to be just a completely me just yet talking to everybody the whole time, but I'll try to go if I'm talking too fast or if you guys have a question, we'll figure out a way to answer those questions and we'll go from there. All right. So um, our company, um, Advanced Therapy and Wellness, which has kind of changed the name a little bit too. And power therapy and one that's kind of our mission and our motto for our company has been super simple humanizing addiction through movement um we feel that we're going to come at this uh, epidemic and and from a movement perception or from a movement concept and take that and go with it all right so let's talk about pain that's what everybody's here for so the definition of pain according to the international association of the study of pain is it's a uh, unpleasant sensory and emotional experience associated with actual or potential tissue damage, right? So the one, one of the first things that we do is one of the groups that we have is um, we go through and we ask every, all the clients to go, hey, tell us what you, how would you say, describe pain to a six-year-old, 
Right. So I'll, I'll kind of challenge you guys all for a second here and, and to try to think of that and think how you would describe it to a six-year-old. And knowing that the six-year-old knows how to speak, right, knows some language, they're not, everything is, they're not end-all, be-all, but they don't know super deep words, so you have to be at least somewhat general. And what happens, most of the people will say, oh, it's something like, oh, it hurts, right? Well, what is hurt? Right, uh, it, it's an ouchie, right? We, if we to try to actually define actual what pain is, it, it has many things for us, right? Um, but what I want to take home message for you guys for everything that we take here is not only is it it's a it's a sensory, okay, feeling, but it also is associated with an emotional experience. Any physical pain that we have will always be associated with emotional experience. It's really really important to understand this because when we go further along, we're going to speak about chronic pain, any physical injury will not will not be resolved completely until that emotional experience has been resolved as well. Um, so something along the lines of the example is if you, uh, you're a football player, you hike the ball and you're about to throw it and you get tackled and you hurt your knee. Uh, from that point on, you, you're out for the season. So you feel like you disappointed your fans, you disappointed your teammates, your players, whatever it is. You do rehab for the entire year and you come back the next year, the first play of the game, you fall again and you get hurt. Nobody touched you. Nobody was even close. And, and the concept and idea is, and it's not always as simple, but you never addressed the emotional aspect of that pain. So when he originally got hurt, if there's the concept is if I have, uh, I let down my players or I feel like my players let me down by not blocking the guys and, and it hurt me, that emotional thought process, that emotional experience that you have will limit you from completely and resolving all the issues that come with it, right? So uh, you, we've all heard of the person that's had 10 knee surgeries or back surgery or whatever, and they end up going to the forest to work with a shaman or some healer, and, and miraculously that healer fixes them. Um, well, that healer didn't, doesn't know anything that the entire medical community didn't know. They didn't do anything that's completely different. Well, one of the things that they did is they probably spoke with the person, uh, started to talk about them as everything in their life and, and got to some sort of emotional pain that that person had that may or may not been the person knew even was associated with it. Um, so we, this is one of the bigger things that we kind of talk about here. And, and one of the things that we try to get all our clients to kind of figure out what occurred or what was happening in your life when you first had an injury. If there is an emotional attachment to that injury, we have to figure it out and to resolve it. A lot of times though, however, it gets resolved on its own. Uh, the, the real world example is you uh, get in a fight with your spouse and you get in a car and you get in a car accident. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that that fight was the part of the emotional experience that you had when you got in the car accident. It may or may not. Have I got to get out of it because talking to you is far more. So then what would happen then is that the, the fight with the, with the spouse will have gotten resolved on its own. You you and them come back and you guys talk it out and then you go do your therapy and all the stuff after you hurt your back from the, uh, whatever car accident that you were in and it's resolved, it's fine. But if you never address that first injury or that emotional experience, you can go on for basically forever until that pain gets resolved. Um, all right, so the, um, the emo importance of the emotional experience physical pain is not only physical, right? This is the whole thing that I would just got talked about. It's not, it doesn't have to be congruent, right? So they can both get resolved without it. Um, this last line here, suffering, it's not understanding the root or cause of their pain. People that have had pain for a really long time, one of the important is to be able to understand why they have it. And one of the things that a lot of the clients would, or people do is they go from doctor to doctor to doctor trying to get an answer. It becomes very difficult to get an answer of why am I having this? And always we're, we're searching to find out what is going on and what it is. And there, there's a big research study that was done about 10 years ago. We talked about patients with um, getting a back MRI. Now, it used to happen to me when I was in private practice. A patient would come in after getting a car accident and they were like, oh, you know, my back hurts a little bit. I'm sore, but it's not that big of a deal. Uh, but they already had an MRI scheduled. Two days later, they get the MRI, um, and then the fourth day, they get it. Uh, they get the report, and it says they have a disc bulge on the right side, right? And initially, their pain was just a little bit. It's not that big of a deal. But now they find out that they have a disc bulge in their low back. All of a sudden, when they come in that next day after finding out, 
oh my goodness, my back hurts so much. Everything is on the right side. It's so bad. It's so drastic. The last, before you knew anything about those results, it wasn't that big of a deal. Now people, that's not people faking it. That's a true manifestation of what, not understanding what your pain is and then having an answer to it. Oh my God, I have a disc bulge. It's really, really bad. That means I'm going to have a lot of problems and have back pain for the rest of my life. Um, whereas disc bulge, 30% of Americans have them and they're asymptomatic. So understanding kind of what is happening and what occurs is really important in the progression. Now, really quickly, I'm going to do just do some general discussion about some of the stuff and then we'll really get to the meat and potatoes of it. Um, the four major types of pain, we have no septic pain, which is basically any tissue injury. Think muscle spasm, um, uh, muscle strain, big bruise on there. Uh, inflammatory pain is anything with inflammation. Uh, it's not just a joint. You didn't just have uh, an inflamed joint, um, but these are, uh, I think, uh, some of the heart disease stuff, heart disease, diabetes, all those are uh, inflammatory diseases. Neuropathic pain is nerve irritation. Uh, so it could be anything from a radiculopathy or actual nerve pain. Um, peripheral neuropathy would be considered under this uh, or any spinal cord injury. And then uh, functional pain is stuff that is without any obvious origin. Okay, so it doesn't have any specific pain. It could be, uh, these are like autoimmune diseases, uh, just general stuff that is all over the place. All right, chronic versus acute pain. Acute pain, everybody knows what it is. It's just a simple, acute, sudden onset, right? I sprained my ankle five minutes ago, it hurts, all right? Um, now, chronic pain is the discussion really kind of differentiates, but we have an actual di definition for it. And this is what basically the medical model follows. Um, it's any pain that is lasting longer than six months or your normal healing time frame, right? So I sprained my ankle. My ankle gets better in about four to six weeks, it's a typical healing time for an ankle. My ankle hurts three weeks later, that is a chronic injury, okay? Uh, I have a shoulder surgery or a, or a low back surgery, or neck surgery. That is a 12-month rehab process or 12-month recovery process. No matter what the surgeons tell you, it's going to take you about a year for you to kind of recover. If your back hurts you three years later, that becomes a chronic condition at that point. The healing time frame is way more important than just the six months. Now, what happens actually over time with the prolonged exposure, if I have the same pain and it continues on and on and on over time, I become hypersensitive, right? Hypersensitive to that pain. That pain will actually literally become worse, right? And that's going to be a, I want you guys to remember this hypersensitivity word right here because we're going to hit back on that drastically um, or it's going to be a repetitive theme and all the things that we're going to be talking about. All right, so tolerance versus threshold. Understanding this point will allow us to appreciate how we treat pain and give us a, 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 an improved perspective on what actually is occurring. So threshold is what it takes for you to actually feel pain, all right? So it's that minimum intensity that you can receive. So if I come over and I push on your, on your hand, if, I, if it takes me five pounds of pressure for you to feel the pain, that's what your threshold is, right? Or I, some people will take more. No, tolerance, is the maximum amount of that that you're able to use for an extended period of time. Um, now, I don't know if I can do a quick little survey. Maybe I can see everybody or at least a big part of it, but quick show of hands before we go to the next slide. Who can guess or who, if you, if you think that, I wanna know which one is, which one is affected by medicine. If you're in the tolerance bandwagon, we'll put your hand up just so I can kind of see. So if you believe tolerance or threshold is affected by medicine, so quickly, if tolerance, you believe medicine can affect tolerance, put your hand up real quick. Okay, I got some yeses, all right. Um, if you are threshold, let's go with the threshold people. Oh. Oh, more threshold. All right. Fantastic. We probably have medical practitioners here or people that have at least heard my talk before. Um, how about both? Who thinks both? Okay, we got a couple. Good. Sweet. Awesome. All right. All right. So before we give the answer, I want to go over a couple more things real quick. I think this will probably give my way. Pain threshold. Um, it's based on the frequency of the stimulus. So think with threshold, it can be temperature. Uh, the, uh, you know, you walk into a room um, and you and you get chilled or you walk outside and it's 
you know, you're, if you've lived in, if you're from up north and you come down to Florida and we get 60 degree weather, it's freezing for us down here. But if you're from up north, you're like, oh, that's nothing. I can walk out in shorts and a t-shirt. 60 degrees, I got, I got a scarf and a parka on, um, you know, but uh, level of loudness, right? If you're at a, the, if you're at a concert, uh, a 20 year old that goes to concerts all the time um, versus somebody that does not appreciate the volume would be a, a irritated by how loud or, or not loud it can be. Um, usually threshold is affected by age and sex, uh, but the frequency is one of the biggest things that has um, to do with it. Now with tolerance, right, it's again, how much we're able to handle throughout the day. And it's typically based on our perce per, uh, perceived importance of that situation. All right. So what is, which one's affected by medicine? All the guys that said threshold, whoops, I don't know how to go back. Boom, all the guys that set thresholds, you guys win one point, right? So threshold, think of it this way. If you are under uh, any substance that is altering your mind or body, you can literally run through a wall and not even feel it, right? People that are uh, intoxicated and get in a car accident typically do not have as many injuries as somebody that is not um, intoxicated. Uh, when you're not intoxicated, uh, when right before the accident, you see it, you are a uh, you brace for it and you get tense. That tension is usually what causes some of the initial trauma that occurs. Um, now, the beauty of this is that tolerance is not affected, okay? Tolerance is not affected by medicine. So what does that mean? I ha hurt my back and therefore I'm gonna take pain meds because the idea is I'm gonna take pain meds for me to be able to go to work and do whatever I have to do. The reality of it, it's, it's, that's not actually how it works at all. It's when, what I, all I'm doing is I'm decreasing my feeling of the pain that I actually have. And I'm not actually able to tolerate any more or any less because of it. Threshold is just that initial, how much is the pain and what I can, I can do with it. Versus tolerance is how much I'm capable of working throughout the day. My example that I tell everybody is my threshold for pain. I am the poster boy for guys being babies for regarding pain. I have a hangnail, I literally could call into work for two weeks, right? Literally that bad. Uh, if I have the flu, God forbid, it, it's where I'm out for six months, I might as well go on disability. So it's, that is my level of pain threshold, okay? Now my tolerance is different. My tolerance is dependent on the situation that I'm in, right? So uh, again, when, when I hurt my, my, my if I get a, to a, a hangnail or, or hurt my fingernail, I, I cannot come into work for a week. However, if my one of my children is uh, in trouble or needed to in danger or needed something, uh, that I could almost probably walk around with with a hole in my leg and I wouldn't even feel it. Okay, so it's depending on the importance. I'll give a quick example, of kind of what something that happened to me um, a couple of weeks ago. I was usually I'm good with cutlery. And I teach my girls all safety and we should always be safe with knives and whatnot. But for some reason, I wasn't paying attention when I was cutting an avocado and I sliced my finger right through the bone, pretty painful. After doing the initial CPR um, and all the acute stuff that we have to do, decrease the blood, bandage it up and all that stuff. I was sitting there for about an hour and a half, no pain whatsoever. Um, and I felt pretty darn good. And then meet, and then all of a sudden I started thinking about what was gonna happen the next week at work. I'm like, oh my God, I'm not gonna be able to work. How am I gonna see patients? How am I gonna manipulate with this guy? I had, there was a bunch of stuff that I had to do. And immediately, immediately, tremendous amount of pain, 10 out of 10 pain came over me. My hand started swelling up. My, my arm started to go numb. It, my, my entire arm, I was like, oh my, it's my left hand. I'm, I'm having a heart attack because I cut my finger. And my, my seven-year-old, and I'm like, guys, well, we, we're going to have to figure out what we're going to do because we're going to have to go to the ER. And my seven-year-old literally just, and she's a little smart ass, she turns around and she goes, you're starting to act like your pain patients. And just in that moment, I was like, oh my God, she's completely correct. Took a step back and realized, okay, uh, my finger doesn't hurt because it hasn't hurt since I put the bandit on and got rid of all the bleeding. The fear and, and the anxiety about what I'm going to be able to do with work now is what's going to what's limiting me and what's causing me this pain. So if I'm able to process that, I'm like, okay, it's going to be okay. People are going to be there. We're going to be able to help. We'll figure it out. It's, I'm going to be fine. I'm going to be able to go to work and all the patients are going to get taken care of. All the pain immediately started going away. The problem is, is that now I teach this and sometimes this happens to us, right? 
But if you don't understand this concept and if we're not able to communicate this with our clients or the people that we work with that are in pain, you don't appreciate this and you end up going down the spiral for the next three, four, five days of anxiety and pain when you, in reality, shouldn't they've even had it. A lot of the times with the actual physical pain that we have, it can be resolved significantly easier, all right? So this is why it's really, really, really important for us to understand this relevance for threshold intolerance. All right, so we're gonna talk about the simple version because there's a way more complicated version of how pain and um, we'll speak about opiates, alcohol, and stress and how that affects our body. This is the simplified, simple version. Um, and it's, I'm not trying to insult anybody's intelligence, but it, it, when we explain it really simply, it becomes fantastic to appreciate. All right, so we have our, um, we're gonna, uh, the example is I come over, I'm gonna use Beth Ann because I see her on my screen. I'm gonna go over to Beth Ann and I'm gonna kick her in the leg, okay? Um, so we have uh, an injury right there, right? So that kick in the leg, she's gonna go, whoo, right? So it, well, as soon as she got kicked, what happens is there's a stimulus, there's a signal that's gonna go to the brain, okay? That brain, that signal's gonna go, we, he kicked me in the leg, right? And then the brain is gonna send two signals back to the injury or the injury site. Um, one is gonna say, ouch, okay, pull your leg back and which is the pain response that we have. The other will send inflammation. Now inflammation is basically gonna be blood with antibodies. It's good antibodies that's gonna promote healing for that area. So wherever I kicked her, there's an injury there. That's what's hopefully is gonna happen that her injury is gonna resolve. Now, as you see here, it's a continuum. It's a big circle. It continues to go around and around and around. That's how we end up healing. Now with opiates, okay? So when we have pain and we'll do a, what, actually, I'll just go it again. So what, what happens here, if you guys can see, is my mouse shown? Bethan, can you see my mouse on the screen? Perfect. All right, so when when you take an opiate or any pain med, NSAIDs work the same way. NSAIDs are ibuprofen, um, Motrin, all that stuff, not acinaminophen. Um, so Tylenol does not count in that. But when you take any pain meds, specifically opiates, okay? Right here, they come in and they block this. They go, hey, brain, there is no stimulus. There is no injury, okay? That is why we do not feel pain or we feel a lot better because we don't feel the actual physical pain as soon as we take the opiate. Now, it takes anywhere from 40 to 45 minutes and 60 minutes depending on your body weight, your size, um, how your body breaks down the specific medicine for it to ingest and begin to work. And then it lasts anywhere from four to six hours depending on the dosage, uh, how your body metabolizes it, and so forth. Um, but so in that time frame, this stimulus right here does not go to the brain, right? So the brain that goes up, oh, there's no injury, there's no stimulus. That's why we don't have pain. So it does not send this pain inflammation signal in to the body, okay? Now, hopefully some of you guys are going, well, well that's, that can't be good because, yeah, it might fix the pain or I might hear that I'm not actually having pain. That doesn't actually fix the pain. You still have the injury. When, when I kick Beth Ann, her leg still is damaged. There's still, now there's no signal that says, hey, there's no injury. So she's not getting any pain. She's not getting the sensation of pain, but also what does not get sent down is inflammation, right? The brain stops sending good healing blood to that area, right? Well, what does that mean? We stop the healing process, right? So let that sink in for a second. We literally stop the healing process when we're taking pain meds and said any of these things that's occurring, all right? Because we're literally telling the body you cannot send, there's nothing there anymore. Now, here's the scary part, okay? After 14 days, one, four, okay? Of consecutive use, right? With um, opiates, here's what occurs. We're gonna go back now, Beth Ann took pain meds for two weeks. I come over and I kick her in the leg. Same exact pressure, same exact way as I did 14 days prior. Well, her body is going to do the same exact thing because it's how the body operates. We're going to send, she's going to get freaked out for a second. Stimulus is going to go to the brain and says, hey, brain, we got kicked in the leg. Now, this occurs 14 days after, op or 14 days of opiate use, okay? Now, instead of just two signals that come back, they say, hey, we have pain and inflammation. Here's what's going to happen. We get thousands and thousands and thousands of signals from the brain to the injury. And now the brain tells the body goes, oh boy, he 
stab me in the leg with an ax and he's got a gun pointing at me. Okay. So same exact thing, right? Kicked her just as hard the second time, right? But after the opiate use with that pressure, the body goes, Oh my God, I am going to die. He's going to gun at me. And he already stabbed me in the leg. Now, if you feel that somebody stabbed you in the leg and you feel that you're in danger, right? Your body's literally going to respond that way. So now her entire leg will swell up. Okay. Her stomach will get really tight and, and sometimes inflammation in there, maybe even get nauseous to throw up. She will be so scared because now she thinks or her body feels like there's a gun pointing at her. Her heart rate will go up. Her blood pressure will go up. Her skin will get red, right? If she was irritated at that moment, she's even more irritated. Now she's even scared, all right? This is with 14 days of opiate use. So when we speak of when, when you read things that say, oh, your symptoms actually get worse and get exasperated or that hypersensitivity, this is exactly what we're talking about, right? So it gets worse after 14 days. We have patients that have been using opiates for years upon years upon years, which is scary in itself to have them experience that. Um, so when patients understand this, when patients go into detox, if we're able to communicate to the patients this and understand and go, hey, listen, here's what you're going to feel. Sometimes you're going to feel like your skin is going to fall off. Everything hurts. You're going to walk out. You're going to go for a walk around the, for five minutes for walking, something you haven't done very much recently. You're going to feel like you got hit by a Mack truck, right? Or you walked for 20 miles. You're going to be sore in places that are significantly never even heard of, muscles that you've never even known you had because of the hypersensitivity. Right now, the cool thing is this, is that it takes about four to six weeks for a brain to heal. Um, so depending on the amount of use, uh, the time frame, again, how your body metabolizes the drug, that will take around that time frame. There's obviously some people that are uh, short, some people are longer. All these studies that we have that are out there, um, not, none of them are, are excellent, uh, but we, we know all, kind of the general parameters of that. Um, now, a scary thing is alcohol. Alcohol, prolonged alcohol use and prolonged stress will do the same exact thing, okay, that opiates do after 14 days. Now, what is prolonged? The research tells us it's, it's all over the place. Um, it's, we, we, there's studies and case studies as little as three months and as, as extensive as six months. So after six months of use, technically, it's, it's prolonged. Um, but he, here's what we'll, we'll speak of is our, in our country right now with COVID, um, there's so much uncertainty. There's some people that are walking around without masks and some people that are not even going back to school. It doesn't matter where you fall in between there. That's a stressful situation for almost anybody and everybody that's involved. So we've had this since I think March when, when the, all the um, issues started really kind of buckling down down here. At this point, we're, we're way past that, right? So as a society, as a world, we are all stressed, right? We're going to go into here in, in a little bit about what occurs when this happens, but Again, appreciate that it's when we're excessively stressed or we're prolonged stress. It's not just excessive, it's prolonged stress. Now combine that with any alcohol use or opiate use, you can imagine the hypersensitivity that occurs, okay? Um, these are issues why when we see people that have basically uh, a poor emotional regulation, uh, when, when this injury here, it's an injury, we're speaking of it as injury, but let's take it as a stimulus, right? So now instead of Beth Ann, getting kicked in the leg by me, Bethann is driving down the street and somebody cuts her off. I cut her off, okay? On any typical day, because Bethann is super sweet, she would be like, oh, it's okay. He's probably just really late or he needs to go do something. It's no big deal. I'm glad everybody's safe. At this point, after this prolonged stress, prolonged alcohol use or 14 days of opiate use, what could happen is, again, I cut her off again. Now, Bethann could literally lose her shit and go super mad, super angry, road rage like crazy, and feel like, I can't believe he did that to me. He's after me, right? 30 seconds down the road, I happened to cut her off again. I didn't even realize it. Goes the opposite extreme and goes, oh my God, I'm super depressed. He's doing this to me. He's picking me out of everybody to cut me off and, and ruin my day. Both of those responses are not a normal response because they're so erratic on both sides of the extreme, but that's what happens when we are hypersensitive to stimulus. It's not just an injury, it becomes a stimulus. Again, 14 days of alcohol use, prolonged alcohol, or 14 days of opiate use, alcohol use, or prolonged stress. Um, if, do, I, do we have any questions or anybody want, 
me to stop or kind of hit on anything so far. And I don't even know how we would do that, but then you'll have to help me with this. Um, yeah, Ahmed, if anybody has a question, you can virtually raise your hand. If you click on the participants tab, you'll see the option below on the right-hand side to raise your hand. And I'll be able to know that you raised it and I can call on you. Okay. I have no idea what you're talking about, but just let me know and then we'll figure it out. All right. Stress. Now this is the fun stuff. Now we're talking about pain and we're gonna go, hey, what, why is he talking about stress? Well, because it is directly related to pain and it's a huge aspect of pain that we as a society and, and have not addressed um, and have not spoken of and the amount of damage that is occurred by stress is tremendous. We'll see how it is right now as we go along here and I'll explain and uh, hopefully we'll not bore everybody too much and we'll kind of go into the discussion, some medical stuff and then we'll simplify it as we go. So this is the complicated version. Um, stress is affects the brain, affects your adrenal glands, it affects cortisol and, and adrenal um, levels, sympathetic and parasympathetic with the fight or flight. We're gonna hit this discussion up right here with the sympathetic and parasympathetic a lot. What we just spoke about with um, the opioid use and the body responding, basically what happened is you become hypersensitive with this fight or flight response, okay? All right, this is an easy, simple picture. Parasympathetic, nice, relaxed, happy. Sympathetic, that's your fight or flight. He's obviously fighting here. All right, stressors, perceived, okay? Uncontrollable or unpredictable environmental demands that are occurring. We all know what stress is. We all have stress. We're all able to appreciate what stress is. It's understanding them and how we cope with them, okay? Now, stress is exactly like pain in that it's a perception. All right. We'll kind of break that down in a few minutes, but just remember that word perceived perception is a huge thing. And it's the, it's the individual's perception that really matters. Okay. Um, chronic stress. Okay. It activates, there's a response to search for the cortisol levels. Uh, we, you, you might've heard cortisol was a, a huge thing that's been talked about in, in the medical community and the wellness community uh, over the last couple of years. It's like, oh, your cortisol levels are probably through the roof. Um, or the, uh, maybe a doc or, or some trainer that, or listen to some couple podcasts will say that to you. But what does that mean? Well, it, chronic stress, you've been, your body's been overworked. You've become, your body's become a hypersensitive. So that when the body is under a fight or flight response, cortisol level goes up, right? So prolonged levels of cortisol being extended and being in our body is a problem. What happens with it? That's when we have our weight gain. That's when we have uh, problems with digestion. That's when a lot of mental health illnesses will begin to start. If you didn't have them, they will begin. If you do have them, they'll become exacerbated with these chronic levels of uh, cortisol levels increase. Okay. Um, and more importantly, it's unmodulated inflammatory responses. Well, again, what does that mean? If all uh, I don't know how many people are in the session right now, but if all of us went to Disney and we all walked around, every single one of us, we all walked in the same group all day long around the same place. When we all got back at the end of the day, four or five hours, six hours later, every single one of us, doesn't matter who you are, will have some sort of inflammation and irritation to your joints, your knees and ankles, maybe even hips and back. Now, some people, the quote unquote healthy people, what will happen is that that inflammation will go away within a few minutes to a couple hours, okay? Um, if you're hydrated, if you don't have a ton of stress that's upon you, cortisol levels are not very high, um, that will occur. Now, the other people that are stressed, okay? So you could literally be stressed about your work, not about the walk around Disney. Now, Disney is a fun thing, but if they're... The, traffic is too much or whatever it may be, you're fighting with your significant other or you're worried about this or that, that is enough to increase your inflammatory response. You will not resolve that swelling in your knee for two, three, four times longer than it typically would. So if your swelling in the knee wouldn't go away for about, an, or would normally go away in about half an hour, an hour, four, five, six hours, maybe even a day later, you still have swelling in your knee, okay? Now, when we have swelling in any joint, our muscles around that joint begin to stop firing. When we have 20 cc's of fluid in our knee, your quad muscles shut down. Now, 20 cc's is a little tiny prick, okay? Not that much. Some people have big, oh, my knee's like a balloon all the time. It looks like I have two knees. 
you're upwards of 500 and 600 cc's, sometimes even close to 1,000 cc's at that point, enough to get a drain, to get your knee drained. But let's think about this. 20 cc's of fluid will begin to shut down a muscle. So if you walk around and you're stressed, okay, and your knee swells up a little bit, 20 cc's of fluid is in there, you literally can take a step and hyperextend your knee because your quad can't fire. Or if you are walking and you continue to walk, your kneecap is jamming into your femur and every other joint causing more damage, right? If you have an old sprain, that sprain now is not supported by any muscles. You're literally walking around on a wobbly knee that's gonna continue causing more pain and more irritation, okay? Um, this is also with increased cortisol levels in this chronic stress situation. Uh, your body will not break down food typically. Um, we'll hit this up quickly, but we'll talk about it a little bit more. Um, Quickest example would be something along the lines of um, uh, you would go, you would eat a chicken breast, right? I'm going to eat chicken breast. It's got 30 grams of protein and you think you're eating 30 grams of protein. Um, now, with the exception of somebody that's got, somebody that's got diabetes or any other GI issue, um, some of this stuff is actually exa more exacerbated. Um, for the purpose of this discussion, we're just speaking of chronic stress and nothing actual digestive that's occurring. Do you have digestive stuff as well? That usually becomes even worse. Um, nevertheless, the 30 grams of protein that you think you're eating from your chicken breast, your body literally will not break all of it down. It'll take about half of it as protein, if that, if you're lucky, maybe 10, and the rest of it will go, eh, we'll just make it into sugar, glucose. And as a matter of fact, we're gonna deposit some of it on our liver, right? So if you think you're eating healthy and you're having your chicken breast and, and sweet potato and you're getting all this protein, your body literally will not break it down appropriately. All right. So that's, again, where we have all this weight gain and, and frustration and irritation. And then we have all the emotional issues that come along with all that. All right. Stress and pain. Um, so this is the actual kind of specific discussion of it. The cortisol secretion happens when we have the pain and stress response, just like when we are stressed, um, just like we talked about with going around Disney uh, with that stressful situation at home. Um, more cortisol will make you feel pain more. Now, it's not significant enough that you go from a two out of 10 to get to a 10 out of 10, uh, but it's enough to increase your pain somewhere upwards of 50% sometimes. Um, now, here's the deal with this maladaptive beliefs. This is basic thing is just poor belief system or poor ways of managing our pain. This will begin to cause more pain. So what this looks like is um, if I believe that if my knee swells up, I should or my, if I get soreness, I should go get ibuprofen, right? So every time I, I have some soreness, I, I go get my ibuprofen, and that's I believe that's going to make me feel better. Um, I'll, I'll hit up on placebo effect later because placebo is extremely important, and we utilize it a lot. Um, but if you believe that and you don't get your ibuprofen, you're, you will believe that, oh, if I get, if I get my ibuprofen, I, I cannot operate. I cannot do this. I cannot work. I, my knee will get worse and I will not be able to do anything. And, and this is going to be really, really bad. And your symptoms literally will continue to exacerbate and get worse. Um, in, if you are in the substance abuse unit or if you work with people in, that have a ton of pain, you will, as they're coming off opiates, right? Or our clients typically, when they first start feeling these things, they, can't, they know they can't get their opiates or they're working and not drinking or using opiates anymore they will hold on to that belief of, if I cannot have my ibuprofen or my Tylenol, my pain will go through the roof. I will AMA if you don't give me my ibuprofen, right? It becomes so drastic and such a huge concept for them in that their belief is that there's no way it's gonna happen. Now, problem is this becomes a memory, right? Their body will truly believe that without the ibuprofen or without whatever the insert name here for whatever they need to help them with their pain, their pain will not go away and it will continue getting worse. It literally works on your fear systems. You believe that you are in danger, okay? Um, Dr. Duncan, who's our medical director, I've asked her so many times, but she refuses to do this. She asked her, can we just do sugar pills for ibuprofen and Tylenol? Nobody will know. The symptoms will not go, they're gonna go away regardless because the patient believes it will help. Okay, they truly believe that if they get their ibuprofen and Tylenol, if we just give them sugar pills, we can literally prove this to all the patients. Unfortunately, it's unethical, and Dr. Duncan is super firm and stern, so we have not been able to give our patients sugar pills. 
but hopefully one day we can do that. I don't know if it will become ethical at all. But if we did, a significant amount of people would be surprised after they find out that, oh my God, I was given sugar pills and my pain actually got better, or I believe my pain got better, therefore it did get better. All right. Um, pain is a stressor, okay? But remember we talked about earlier, pain is a perception. So whatever your perception of what pain is or what can be pain, um, that will become a stressor in itself too for you. All right, effects on chronic stress. So here's what we see. These are real world diagnoses. This first one is my favorite one. I put this one up every time I actually get a chance to do um, a diagnosis or anything that we get to speak about super big diagnoses. This diagnosis, fibromyalgia, is not a real diagnosis. It's been used for many, many years, but unfortunately, um, there's some people that continue to use this. Here's what fibromyalgia means, and here's what we've always used it as, is when we have no idea what the patient's pain is, what the cause of it, what is happening to it, or why they have pain. So we tell a patient, basically, uh, we have no idea what's wrong with you. We don't know how to treat you. We don't know how to help you but we're gonna tell you that a fancy word that says you have pain all over and there's nothing you can do about it. So pain, and we don't know what to do about it. If we actually just hear that and we hear it in these real terms, because this is actually what happens, but we never tell the patient that. We just, with real conviction or real diagnosis, and we even used to have a diagnosis code that says fibromyalgia. It means you have pain and you have no idea how to treat it. Imagine the fear, imagine the, the stress that will come about with that. If you went to go take your car in because you heard a noise that was happening in your car and the mechanic comes out and goes, yeah, you got a noise in your car. We don't know what it is, but your car could blow up at any moment or it could not. Have a nice day. None of us would be okay with that. We would not be, imagine the fear. You, every, you're, every second you're driving around, I could die because my car's gonna blow up or I can be fine. I have no idea. We're just gonna risk it. We're gonna see what happens. That same exact thing happens to patients with fibromyalgia or patients that get diagnosed with fibromyalgia because we never actually spent the time or enough energy or refer them to the proper people to help them. Um, chronic fatigue syndrome, same thing. Um, chronic pelvic pain. Now, with the chronic conditions, it becomes a belief system, right? Um, and TMJ is the last one. Um, these three are a little bit different with fibromyalgia because fibromyalgia is a, a way more uh, psychosocial kind of mental diagnosis because we're allowing the patient to believe a certain belief. With these issues, chronic pelvic pain and TMJ, these become um, very detrimental on the person's quality of life. Now, a lot of diagnoses do, but these three for, in general, are three of the most common ones that we have um, in that if you have jaw pain or pelvic pain, your life your, the quality of life literally changes and it adjusts because you're, you feel this and you're aware of it 24 hours a day. You never have a time where you get to um, not feel this or not think about this. That becomes extremely stressful, becomes an extremely difficult thing to operate with. Um, low levels of serotonin are implicated into the ideology of depression and nociceptive transmission in the spinal cord. So we are able to see and talk about how we know what serotonin levels and dopamine levels do. We know what their involvement is in the mental health arena, okay? But up until recently, we didn't really know how they had any, or if they even had anything to do with inflammation, but now we have enough evidence and support to tell us this, okay? Um, with the tryptophan breakdown, that's what's gonna cause inflammation. This will directly, okay, decrease our levels of serotonin, all right? Now we're gonna remember this, um, with the serotonin levels, I want you guys to kind of remember this one again. So we have hypersensitivity and serotonin and dopamine levels, because um, these gonna be things that we're gonna kind of bring them back at the end here. But at the end of the day, stress will cause levels of serotonin, <laughs> lower levels of serotonin, lower levels of serotonin will cause increase in inflammation, okay? I remember a few minutes ago, I just said, inflammation is the root of all evil, it will cause you pain. But most of our, Physical pain symptoms, joint pain symptoms are caused by inflammation. So you're stressing out, you're causing more inflammation in your body. Right? All right. 
Um, again, this is just kind of repeating itself. Some of the stuff I left on purpose in here, just so I'm not going to keep reading all these things, but you guys can have this because good information. Sometimes you guys can go, I don't remember what he said about all this stuff. Um, but this is how cortisol and serotonin, um, just a couple of things for you guys to kind of remember and read um, to show you this. All right, so that was the real complicated version and all the science behind it. I'm probably lost some people on some of these things, hopefully not. But this is the real world example. Okay, this is really easy. When we explain this to patients, they it, it's really awesome when people kind of get this concept. Um, just like the concept with opiates, we can tell people that opiates are bad and you should not take them. Um, but when we explain the concept with what happens after 14 days uh, and how you become hypersensitive, and if you've ever been through a detox or if you've ever had that hypersensitivity where your skin literally feels like it's on fire, um, it's, it's really hard to appreciate what that means. So we're going to go on a little field trip. Okay, We're going to go to back to the caveman days. All right, so I want you guys to join me here. It's a lot more fun when we have a group and everybody's talking, uh, but we'll just kind of go along and I want you guys to play around with me. So we're, we're cavemen now, cavemen and women, uh, caveman days. We are walking around our desert or whatever. We are away from our cave. We're hunting for food. Now, in your head, kind of think of some of the things that could be stressors um, in for you as a caveman, right? So some of those things might be finding food, right? Shelter. Uh, the biggest one is on the screen. I'm giving it away. It's a tiger or a lion, right? The lion can come get me, right? The lion can eat me. I could die, right? So we're going to play a game and we'll do the whole hands up again real quick, just so we can get a quick little setting. So if the lion is a mile away, I can see him, right? But he's a mile away. How many people are freaking out already? Put your hand up real quick and just keep it up for a second. There's a mile away. Are we freaking out and jumping away? Okay, sweet. A couple of those people are awesome. Okay, now, how about half a mile? Half a mile, how many people are scared at half a mile? Okay, a couple more hands. Awesome, good. Okay, what about when the lion is 100 feet away? Everybody better put their hands up or I know you're not listening. Just kidding. Um, some people might not get scared with that. But 100 feet away, we... Most of us are scared, okay? Now, here's what happens. And this literally happens for cavemen and still happens today. So the lion is 100 miles away or 100 feet away. Oh, boy. I didn't curse there. Good job, me. Oh, boy. We're going to run. We're gonna, not going to fight the lion. The lion's going to win. So there's no fighting. We're going to run as fast as we can. Well, our body does a couple things. The first thing is it's going to send blood to our extremities, okay? So it's going to send them to our hands or feet. Because if I'm going to run, I need to get blood to my feet so I don't cramp up and I have enough energy to be able to operate and run away from, the, from that lion, right? Second thing is our, 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 all the systems in our body are going to shut down. Same thing that our body, what our car does when we go on cruise control. If you're driving on a long road trip, the reason why you put the car on cruise control is so you're not going up and down in speed. You end up saving gas because you're going the same speed. Well, the body's going to go, hey, listen, if I have an infection in my body and I'm not going to fix that right now because if I get eaten by the lion, there's really no point for us to even have an infection. It doesn't even matter. So all the, all the energy, all the blood that's going to the infection, we're going to stop it. We're going to send it to our joints, okay, or to our hands or feet. First system that shuts down is our immune system, okay? If you were hungry, you wouldn't be hungry anymore because you're running away from the lion. You're, not, you're about to get eaten. If you, were, if you had to go pee, you don't have to go pee anymore. If you're thirsty, you're not thirsty anymore. If you're angry, you're not angry anymore. Whatever you were feeling, it's not there anymore because the only feeling that you're feeling is get away from the tiger, okay? Now, we literally do this. We are so good at this. We're, it's a science. If, I, if we do um, an, or, an organ transplant, the person that's receiving the organ, if we just call it a liver, for example, if we give that person a liver, we take the liver out from the, their donor and we put it in the recipient, we just do it just like that the recipient's body will literally fight the liver because it's a foreign body and kill it, okay? So here's what we do. We give the recipient stressors for medicine to stress their body out. Do it for about a week before they receive the organ and we do it for about two weeks after. After we do it for a week, we insert and surgically put the organ in and allow it 
it to get accustomed to the body. We do it for another couple of weeks or the body does not do it. So when we stress the body out, the body's natural reaction is to decrease its immune system. It literally stops fighting itself and fighting any immune, any, any virus or anything, and then allows the body to kind of assimilate to the new organ. Now, if you are following and you're really paying attention what's happening outside, we have this thing called COVID, okay? It's a virus, right? Now, no matter what your belief on the virus is, right? Even if you think it's a flu or it's not, even if we look at it as the flu, with this, when you are running away from the tiger, if somebody walks by you and has COVID and kind of coughs over you, your, suscept your, your, your susceptibility goes through the roof during this fight or flight time. So when we're running away from the t lion, you just really hope that there's nobody that's got COVID around you. But we'll come back to it and we'll see what happens. Last part is the front brain and the hind brain. So the front part is the front part of our brain. The hind part is back. The front part is responsible for the conscious and logical thought process. So for me to um, to open up my computer or to go on a website, I, I have to turn my computer on. I have to open it, turn it on. I have to pull the right um, program to pull it up. So it's Safari or Firefox or whatever you use. And then you type in the website. There's conscious thought process that goes through this. Now, when we're uh, the hind bar is re responsible for reflexive, right? So if there's a loud boom that happens behind me or behind me to the left, I'm not going to go towards it. What happens, I would jump away from it. Just a normal reflex. In this time of running away from the tiger, my, I'm not going to use my conscious thought process. My body's not going to go, okay, there's a tiger here. I got to run over this stone. I got to jump up with my left leg. I got to do a spin move and then go hide behind this tree. You're just going to run and find yourself to safety. Your body automatically does this, okay? So now these three things occur on a regular basis, right? When we're stressed. Now, 15 minutes later, after we run away from the lion, now we're safe. Our blood begins to go back to the rest of our organs. Our immune, all the systems begin to turn back on. Our hind brain now turns off, goes back to front brain and conscious thought process. So then we're able to go, okay, well, there's a lion here. Now we got to protect our home. We got to put a fence around our cave and whatnot, okay? And all life is happy. Now, this is what was called the fight or flight response, right? So, the caveman days. Now we're going to come back to our life, okay? What happens, for the next screen, um, with our patients that, remember we talked about the patients with 14 days of opiate use or prolonged alcohol use or prolonged stress, okay? These patients end up, or everybody, or not everybody, but most people that are going through this stuff will be in a fight or flight response, okay? When we have these things occurring, you're, you're, you're not going to heal. If you have a, an injury somewhere in your back or your shoulder or whatever it may be, you literally stunt the healing process because blood is not on a consistent basis going to your joint. It's going to your hands and feet, your extremities. That's why we see a lot of swelling with excessive stress. Okay? Your immune system is compromised. Literally, if, if you are a strong person that has no comp immunocompromised diseases, for the most part, you're healthy, but you're super stressed and you're drinking a lot, or you're super stressed and using opiates to deal with the pain, the chances of you getting COVID, and God forbid, not only just getting it, but able to fight it, significantly compromised. Okay, The seriousness of this has to be a much bigger topic than we actually just speaking or how much we're, we're not giving it um, uh, enough uh, importance. And for everybody in the world, not just our patients, but even for our patients, this is one of the first things that we have to discuss with them, okay? And the last part is the conscious first reflexive. There's many times where patients will talk about how they're having problems coping. Stress happened after COVID started, uh, my, my, my pain started. I couldn't cope with my 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 stuff, my issues, and my my this or that or the stress that's happening, and pain happened, and it got worse, right? And then before I knew it, I was drinking, right? Well, when we're in this fight or flight response, we are not having good conscious thought process. You're not going, hmm, I should probably not drink right now. I should call my sponsor. I should do all the things that I've learned or read about that helps me manage my stress. You don't have that capability. It's literally physically not even possible. You go immediately to a reflex. Patients literally will say, I was, I got off work and this happened, I got in a fight and next thing I know I have a beer in my hand. I didn't even know what happened. I didn't even think about it. I didn't even, I have no idea what occurred. I was just, it was just a reflex. 
And that's really what happens with this fight or flight response. It becomes a reflex. Stress, respond, stress, respond, stress, respond. A lot of times our responses are these behaviors and patterns that we have from the past. Again, it's a reflex, it's a response. We are not even setting ourselves up for success, right? Or you're setting up yourself, you're setting yourself up for failure if you're operating under this fight or flight response for an extended period of time and having adding stress, alcohol, or opiates to it. It's really, really, really important for us to speak to our patients about this. This is the importance of this, this is the seriousness of how we're gonna uh, be able to address the extensive relapse rate. This is how we're gonna be able to deal with chronic pain, okay? Because with chronic pain, the stress levels go up. We just talked about it with the cortisol levels, right? So stress levels are gonna go up, inflammation is gonna go up. We're gonna continue having these issues and continue the fear of this is ever gonna get better, it's never gonna happen, and we continue going back on all these three things, okay? So we haven't been able to address this. Now, here's what this looks like in the real world, okay? Big picture stuff, okay? I'll hit the poor diet one in just a second. 60% of Americans have one chronic disease. If that doesn't scare everybody, I'm not sure what will, okay? 60% of Americans have one chronic disease. 40% have an average of 2.7 chronic diseases. Now, these are, again, anything that's longer than six months or your average healing frame. If you have diabetes, that falls into this. Okay. If you have heart disease, if you have cancer, all these chronic, almost all autoimmune diseases. Okay. If you have knee pain longer than a year or how, two years, whatever it may be, 60% of Americans have one chronic disease. 40% have 2.7. Okay. Here's the scary part. We would think, oh, these are all genetic diseases also. Less than 1% of the diseases in the United States have to do with genes. These are all man-made human-made diseases that we're talking about, okay? These chronic diseases, not genetic diseases, okay? Stress is response for 90% of disease. If there's anything that you guys get from this discussion, hopefully it's a bunch of stuff, but this is the one thing I want you guys to take away with this. Stress is responsible for 90% of disease. Stress will cause inflammation. Inflammation will cause disease. Progressive. Prolonged stress will cause prolonged cortisol um, and prolonged inflammation or extensive inflammation causing disease, 90%, okay? This is a big, big deal. We'll talk about how we can address some of this stuff and what's the fastest and quickest way for us to help our patients with this. But this big picture slide, kind of the reason it looks different than every other one because I wanted to make sure that we all talk about this. Our poor diet, the number one reason for chronic disease. Does anybody have a guess on what that diet would look like or what disease happens from that or what one of the problems is? Anybody want to join? I guess we'd have to- Diab them. Diabetes from SAD, standard American diet. Is that Linda Hayes who said that? You get the gold star for the day. Tina. Lady. Awesome, fantastic, that is correct. Diabetes is the number one cause for this. The two largest death factors and, and diseases in the United States. One, heart disease, two, cancer, okay? One heart disease, two, cancer, the two biggest killers in the United States. The biggest factor for both of those diseases that will give you a fast pass to get those disease and fast pass for death is diabetes, okay? Now, we're not going to speak about juvenile diabetes because that's a completely different thing. Juvenile diabetes and, and type 2 diabetes, there's almost literally nothing that they have in common besides the name diabetes that's in them. It's, it's actually unfortunate that they have that. Um, the type 2 diabetes should really be called human-induced diabetes or self-induced um, diabetes. Um, but regardless, we're just, we'll speak about the sugar aspect. Now, we think that diabetes is this thing that you have from increasing or eating poorly for an extensive period of time and, and whatnot. Um, recent study was done on collegiate athletes. So we took collegiate athletes, division one, two, and three athletes, fairly healthy, right? We were thinking that these guys are pretty darn good. And we took them, we checked their glucose levels, their blood glucose levels. And then 14 days later, we checked them again. Now in those 14 days, we took their sleep and divided it by half, 50%. 50% decrease in their sleep. So all of them went from anywhere from seven to 10 
We cut all their sleep in half for two weeks. And we checked them again two weeks later. Every single one of those athletes became pre-diabetic. Okay? Pre-diabetic. That means their glucose scores were above 100, below 140. All right? Two weeks of poor sleep will make you pre-diabetic. That is super scary, okay? Think back on, on, on the holidays. Now, we just finished end of the year um, and, and all the holidays. And if you're running a business or own a business or whatever it may be, all the stress that happens at the end of the year and all the beginning of the year stuff. Two weeks of poor sleep will make you pre-diabetic. Being pre-diabetic with the increase, what you have, but again, it's the stress that's on your body. Inflammation will occur. Your susceptibility to fighting a disease will go down. Your, or your ability to have more pain and your aches and joints will go down. Um, your ability to gain more weight because your body's not able to break down the food properly, no matter how healthy you're eating, will go down, right? So this is a big deal. Diabetes is a humongous factor. Diabetes and stress, I do not believe, get addressed appropriately, get addressed enough, okay? Um, especially with diabetes because in our population and the population that we're speaking about in substance abuse, especially with alcohol, there's a huge sugar, sugar craving that occurs. There's a huge sugar problem that we are not addressing whatsoever. Um, it is standard operating procedure for somebody to say, oh, you know, after alcohol, you're going to fiend, you're going to be wanting sugar. So have candy next time you have a craving. Well, the reality of the situation is that's actually probably some of the worst advice we can give that person because if we're going to give them more sugar. We're, we're doing the same thing that the alcohol was doing to the body, right? The body's going to take that and breaking it down. And then we're going to ask more stress to the body. If you're going to have more stress, we're again, we'll go back to our little section here more stress immune systems compromised our brain we're not thinking conscious thought process anymore we're going to a reflexive thought process right so this happens so now our clients the alcohol clients now not using conscious thought process relapse okay i think this is a big part this is a spot that we have not addressed um it is not looked in when we speak to clients when we speak about relapse prevention we speak about what occurred and what happened a lot of times when we really go down and break down diet it's one of the first things oh i was eating poorly i'm not sleeping i'm stressed well fast track there we go this is how we can check the stuff right as soon as we start seeing patients that are not sleeping well as soon as we start seeing people that are eating poorly or start having poor eating habits is the time that we're supposed to be able to jump on these people take care of them prep them Educate them so we can make the changes prior to. All right. The last thing that we go with people, little quiz, last quiz. I think there might be one more actually. Um, perception versus reality. We've talked about stress and pain, how they, they are perception. Okay. The one of the reasons why I asked everybody about the line being a mile away, half a mile away, and 100 feet away is when we asked about a mile away, some people put their arm up, okay? They perceive that as a threat. Some people did not. At half a mile away, some more people perceived that it was a threat, but not all. And I'm sure, I think that I saw one person or a couple of people that did not put their arm up with the 100 feet away. So they didn't perceive that, right? Now, at 100 feet, I'm freaking out that the lion is there, right? But there was a, the person that didn't put their arm up. I wouldn't have put my arm up at a mile away. I would have been like, okay, I got enough time to get away. So the level of pain that will be perceived, the level of anxiety, the level of stress that will be had for the person that put their arm a, a mile away will be higher because they are, their perception is different, right? And all of us were listening to the same thing. All of us are looking at the same line, a mile away, half a mile away, and a hundred feet away. Every single one of us will have an actual threshold. And when we go, oh boy, that's my level that's what my perception of pain is, okay? Now, now, is this correct? Thoughts, emotions, feelings. Do our thoughts control our emotions, control our feelings? Let's go a hand up if you believe that is true. This is actually really important. Please participate if possible. Do you guys believe this is true? Thoughts, emotions, feelings, okay? If you're a clinical therapist and you already know the answer, technically it's not really fair, but it's okay. All right. Or is this correct? Feelings, emotions, thoughts. Who believes this part? Feelings, emotional thoughts. Okay. All right. Awesome. Fantastic. Now, patients, when we give this to them, we go, hey, which, what, what happens here? Are your feelings controlling your emotions, controlling your thoughts? 
Absolutely. I get really angry or I get really pissed off or really sad. I start doing stuff. Then I start thinking about all the things that are happening because of it. Reality, this is not how this actually works. This is not real. This is not what happens. What happens is, is thoughts. We have thoughts. Okay, We're able to control our thoughts. Our thoughts lend us to emotions and then lend us to have feelings. Emotions and feelings, my belief, or at least in what we try to teach our clients, especially the ones with chronic pain, is that they're just data. Okay, The example we give is when you, uh, you're on your phone, you look at the uh, weather app. Okay, if you have a weather app or if you go check the weather before you go out, what is the reason for us to check the weather? Well, I, I want to know what I'm going to wear. I want to know what I'm going to be prepared for. If it's 100 degrees outside, 100 and sunny, I'm not bringing my jacket, right? If it's, it's 60 and rainy, okay, well, I'm, I'm not bringing my nice shoes. I'm going to wear boots, right? I'm going to bring my rain jacket, maybe an umbrella. If it's 30 and snowing, okay, we're going to have to wear pants, layer up, and, and, and make sure you're, you're bundled up. Now, we... We never freak out and go, oh my God, it's 30 degrees and waning and snowing, or oh, it's awesome, it's, it's sunny, right? It's, it's data, it's just weather's weather. Now, we might alter our activities, but it, for the most part, it, it does not cause significant changes in our, in, our, in our actions or our lifestyle. We just take it for what it is and we just work with it. It's just data that was given to us. Emotions and feelings are basically the same thing. Now, when we help teach this to our clients, Again, especially with ones that have chronic pain because their emotions and feelings are what control their thoughts, or at least that is their belief, okay? Understanding that emotions and feelings are just now data, we take away a huge aspect and huge power from those things because basically if you have, you feel your emotions and feelings control you and they're what base your life is, you have no control. And if you have no control, you have no power. If you have no power, you have no ability to be able to help yourself or, or not struggle through life or with address your pain. As soon as we realize and appreciate that our thoughts lend us to our emotions and feelings, what that means is if we're, think, if we're feeling bad, right? That means you're thinking bad. Literally as simple as this. We literally have to speak to our patients, our clients in that basic terms. So if I'm feeling super anxious, super mad, super sad, whatever the feeling, insert name here, don't be sad about it and pissed off about it. Be excited about it. Yes, I'm feeling anxious. I'm feeling mad. I'm feeling all these things. I'm, I'm so happy that I'm actually feeling it. Now let's think why I'm feeling it. What am, what's going on here? If I'm feeling this way, now I'm thinking negative thoughts. It has to be. Okay, let me see what I'm thinking about. And then let's address them. Goes back to the example what I had with my finger when I hurt my finger. My feelings, my thoughts were, oh, my God, I'm not going to be able to work. I'm not going to be able to help the patients. The patients are going to get mad. Maybe they're going to want to leave. Maybe they're going to be triggered by us. Oh, my God, this thought process. And then it goes, oh, well, I'm not going to be able to see my patients. I'm not going to be able to have a company anymore. I'm not going to be able to see anybody. I'm, we're going to lose our house. And then my little one says, oh, you're just acting like a pain patient. Oh, okay. Back to reality. I'm just afraid and anxious that I might not be able to do the work that I do. Okay, well, I'll just prep ahead of time. I'll make sure that we have extra help. We'll make sure we have other people around us. We'll make sure that we communicate the steps so people are aware that I cannot do as much. Okay, now it feels better, right? So when we explain this, thoughts, control your emotions and feelings, and we have control over our thoughts. As soon as we do that, now we're able to go, okay, so I have control over my pain. I have control over my stress, okay? I get to choose how I respond to it. Now, at that point, once we at least get the patients to understand this, then we hand them off to you guys. Because that's out of our scope now. You guys got to do all the serious work. You guys got to do all the CBT, DBT, EMDR, and all the awesome therapies that you guys do. We just help them understand it. But the problem is this, is without understanding this concept, without understanding this, there's physically no possible way for us to help the patient. I can do the most amazing therapy in the world. And I would like to think that I'm one of the best in the world. However, if the patient is always stressed, if the patient is always anxious, if the patient believes that he's not going to get better and this is going to continue happening and they're just doomed because they have bad luck forever and ever and that they're not good enough and they're always going to do this and this has always happened to them, there is physically nothing that I can do to help them. I can give them the most amazing exercise. It will not do anything. Okay? However, if we get them to start believing that they actually have control over their thoughts and they have that they will control their emotions and, and feelings, 
they have the ability to appreciate what pain is and be able to perceive it differently, then we have a real chance. Then we have, then, then, then it becomes actually really easy. That's really why I'm good is because I'm not really that good at what I do is we just give patients exercises and we make them feel better, but we get them to learn this stuff. Then they're like, oh, he's the most amazing therapist ever. Well, thank you. It's awesome. It's just, but all we did was just help you think differently. And that's the difficult part. This is one of the hardest things that we have with chronic pain patients because their identity has become associated and attached to pain. A lot of patients will literally say, oh, I can't, sit. I can't walk this far. I, I can't sit too much. I can't go to groups because I can't sit because I know I can't sit for more than 10 minutes. I know if I go for a walk, my back will start hurting. I know if I did this, my joints will hurt and I have to take my pain meds. I know if I stood up for 15 minutes, sometimes patients have stuff down to the second. If I stand for more than seven minutes, my back will hurt. I cannot stand for seven minutes. I cannot sit for an extended period of time. However, when we're speaking to them or when we do things where they get distracted and they don't understand, when we take them out of their perception and take them out of their beliefs of what their pain is, they're capable of doing many things that they thought they couldn't have. And I, that's, I think that's where the chronic pain patients get a bad rep is we don't sometimes see their pain. Right. We, we, if I've had a shoulder surgery and somebody or back surgery, back surgery is an easy one because a lot of people have experience with that. Is if you've had back pain, if you've had back surgery and you feel better, the person that had back surgery that's still complaining about it 10 years later, you don't understand. You don't see their pain either. If I told you guys that I had a stomach ache right now, you can't not, not believe me. You have a, just a stomach ache. There's nothing to see. There's nothing that shows that I have a stomach ache. But if I had, I have a I have a bandaid on my finger. Oh, he really did cut his finger, right? Or if he if I had a sling on my shoulder, oh, he must have hurt his shoulder. Let me help you open up um, the door when you walk by. But if you don't see the injury, it becomes really really difficult to have empathy or appreciate the pain that the person has. And a huge part of chronic pain is you do not feel that people believe you. And with all the uh, media that the opioid epidemic has gotten. Everybody feels like, oh my God, you just think I'm trying to seek for pain. You just think I'm just trying to get pain meds. I'm not trying to get pain meds. I'm not doing this. Or, or there's a lot of emotional struggle in, in, in conversation about this is real. Patients want to talk. This is real. That's one of the first things that they say. My chronic pain is real. Are you trying to tell me this is in my head? Absolutely not. It's not in the patient's head. These, this pain is real. It's a perceived pain. They, it is as real as it is. is Anything that you can ever experience. These, this pain is not, not real. chronic pain, real pain. But when we understand that pain is a perception, what we're feeling and what we perceive to be pain is what's causing us pain, it's a big deal. Now, this has been demonstrated all across different aspects in, in, our, in our world, in our medical community. Um, I, I, there's a, multiple ladies on the screen right now, so I'll use this example pregnancy. Okay. The, Pregnancy in the United States versus pregnancy in different parts of the world. There's other factors other than just what we're going to talk about with the pain perception, but there's this, there's a huge part of the world that and does it safely on a regular basis has childbirth with no epidurals, no pain meds whatsoever. In the United States, there's other political factors that are involved in it, but there's or basically um, hospitals and, and turnover and whatnot, but um, we believe pregnancy and the delivery process is extremely painful across the board. Now, some of us, most of us don't even know. I'll be honest. I have no idea what I was talking about before we had our kids. Um, but the perception is it's extremely painful and you, you have to have your epidural, right? And if you don't, it's, it's crazy. You're going to die if you don't, right? The, the pain could be so tremendous during pregnancy that you literally could die. However, on a regular basis, there's people that take an epidural and it either is done incorrectly or done too late. And you still feel everything and you deliver the baby and you talk about how you took the epidural and it didn't work, but you still delivered your child and, and you still lived. Other parts of the world, epidurals are not discussed, are not looked at as a, as a way and a method of delivery. And, the, and it takes away from the beauty of the child delivery process. So having that, and you, there's, it's almost a right of passage, it's a positive thing that occurs. They use 
epidural significantly less. They have the same amount of awesome delivery that we have, and actually their numbers are a little bit better. Um, personal experience for me on this perception was the first child that we had, we didn't really know what was going on. And we had our first child, she had an epidural and the mom had an epidural and normal delivery, but she went through some pain. Second child, um, we both felt that we didn't really know what we were doing. And it was kind of awkward that something so big in your life that you didn't really study or educate yourself on. So we did a lot of research, did a bunch of different programs and went from like going to the hospital once or twice to learn about pregnancy. Then all of a sudden you should be ready for a kid, I guess, to take in uh, an extensive eight week, 18 week course on pregnancy and just delivery, literally just on the delivery process. And what you learned is, Every, there's a step that occurs when you're first pregnant till the actual physical delivery process. And even in the delivery process, there's different stages. And with these stages, after stage this, you get to that from here to this, to this and so forth. And what was really awesome is that um, when stages, the, I specifically remember she was, she, we would go through a phase and she's like, okay, this next phase is going to really suck. It's going to be some really painful stuff with these next contractions, but it means I'm going to meet the baby next. There's so much euphoria. There's so much happiness. So even though I'm going to have this pain next in a couple more minutes, I'm going to be meeting our baby and it's going to be really, really awesome. And all of a sudden we perceive pain like, oh, this is exciting. Yes, this is not bad at all. This is fantastic. And when you have the baby, deliver the baby, then it's the euphoria that occurs is so tremendous. Now, again, this happens all across the world. It's not just for shoulder pain, back pain, or delivery process. This is us understanding what pain is, understanding what we're supposed to feel and go through, and then how we can manage it and what we perceive it, right? So these things are just real world examples that I want you guys to think about. And maybe when we speak with our patients, hopefully this can give you guys some ideas or even thoughts to kind of give different examples um, if we don't get a chance to give a, a, a question and answer session, if you have an, other ideas or other examples, please shoot them over because I always will borrow those from you guys and use them with other clients moving forward. Um, I think this is the second last one on stress. We, can ha we have control over what we believe, therefore we have control over our perception of stress, okay? Um, simply stated, um, it's not, it's very difficult for clients to see this, but once they do this, we are giving our clients back a power that they have not had for an extremely long time. And our patients, chronic pain patients feel helpless. Okay? They cannot, I'm gonna always have this pain. My quality of life is affected and I will always feel like this. My, might as well take me in the back and shoot me. But once we start allowing the patients to understand and appreciate this, this is a game changer. We're literally changing people's quality of life with just understanding this. What, the work that you guys do is so amazing and powerful that this is, has to be something that we discussed with our patients. Um, last thing, oh, this is, what, this is the last one. So our cells respond to what we believe. So if you believe you're stressed, the cells will respond to that. Whether or not new belief is real or not, it's the perception of the belief, okay? And our cells, they don't have feelings. They don't have ideas or anything. They're just responding. They're just stimulus. So they're, whatever it is, if I feel bad, the response is gonna be bad. That's why we asked that question about a mile away, half a mile away and, and 100 feet away. The people that said a mile away, at a mile away, they started feeling bad. They started getting anxious a little bit. Their heart rate would go up. Their cells were going to respond that way. Um, it's 12.30. There's a couple important things. I'm going to run through this. We have, these are all statistics that we have uh, on uh, acute low back pain and, and uh, opiate and opiate use. Um, seven days, our pain gets twice as bad and patients will be disabled. Um, more likely, to, twice as bad to get, twice as likely to get disabled a year later. Um, within 15 days of the order of the opioid prescription, um, longer disability, work disability occurs. Um, when we, here, this one is really, really important for us as well. Again, when we address this early on, when we get involved, both physical therapists, mental health practitioners, and we speak of this pain early on, we have a 30 to 60% reduced downstream use. Within two weeks, Within two weeks of an injury, if we're able to explain to the patients why they have the pain, how they're gonna do it, 30 to 60% decrease. Multiple research studies across eight years worth of time. Um, patients that use any knee, knee, back and shoulder disorders, okay? 
they receive physical therapy, they're opiate free 80% of the time. Okay. We're talking about real work here. We're talking about real patients that we're able to help. Um, this is a quick one about what happens with our in, in addiction and recovery with regards to physical therapy and strength training. Um, this kind of gives the validity to the fact that we have, there's a huge community that says, oh, you should exercise, you should do strength training, because when you get strong, uh, you, you have a much better success in, in your recovery, in re, uh, addiction recovery, okay, specifically for addiction recovery. Improved neural function, that means your brain's able to work faster, reduce anxiety, reduce insomnia, reduce depression from a strength training program. This was not a CrossFit program that you were going crazy stuff, just a little bit of three days a week worth of strength training and resistance training. It does not matter as long as you have a little bit of resistance three days a week, it increases your chances of recovery. Okay. All right. So now we know how to help. Okay. But what are we going to do now with all this information? We know that stress is really bad. We know that sugar is really bad. And this is two of the main things that cause inflammation. Inflammation will cause us pain. You know, the pain is a perception. Okay. And if we are able to appreciate it and think of it differently, we'll be able to address it. So now what? Okay. Um, again, these are these super long things. This is one of the more important things. If your physical therapist is not speaking of pain neuroscience, okay, um, or, or any person that's working with pain, they have to speak with pain neuroscience education. We have to educate the clients on what that is. Um, we're not going to get too, too heavy into it. We're going to touch a little bit onto that. Um, but send your people that have pain to get some pain neuroscience education. Um, if you don't know anything about it, just Google pain neuroscience education. Um, if, if you want stuff, I'll, I'll send a bunch of this, these issues to you or um, uh, information for you to read and, and work on. It's not that difficult. It's very valuable everywhere. So you don't have to spend thousands of dollars. You don't have to spend any money to get educated on this stuff. Um, but it's simple, basic things that we should be educating our pain patients. Um, the role of physical therapists in addiction recovery, just like, uh, you know, for us, we speak of it as physical therapists because I'm obviously biased to that group and who we are. Um, but these are some of the things that should be occurring. We're screening our patients. We have to be able to rule out if there's actual other musculoskeletal issues that's occurring. Um, we have to address strength and mobility, right? We have, we know that we got to get stronger. Okay. So regardless of the strength, we don't, doesn't mean we have to lift hundreds of pounds and, and do all sorts of crazy stuff, but just early on a progression of any program should have mobility and strength progressions in it. Any dysfunction that they have, if somebody actually has physically a joint dysfunction or their spine is rotated or they have muscle imbalance, we have to fix those things. Um, understanding the pain is one thing, but then when we do have severe impairments or some serious stuff, we have to be able to work it. The person that's working with your clients for this has to be able to appreciate and work on all these things. It has to be a multidisciplinary approach. This does not work just with what we do. I used to have a private practice and we thought we did some serious work with pain. However, if we go back and we look at some of the statistics that we had and carried on, patients with chronic pain issues, how long they stayed out of pain, it was very difficult. It's really difficult in a, in a outpatient physical therapy practice or with an orthopedic surgeon or any outpatient practice for a patient to come in and has shoulder pain that's been going on for years for me to go, hey, tell me about your childhood. Hey, tell me about what's going on with you and your significant other. Hey, tell me about the trauma that you've had over the last 10 years, 20 years. Tell me about the stress in your life. We just ask, hey, do you have any stress in your life? Yes, we checked that box. Okay, now what? Nobody ever does anything about it. Um, at least in the physical therapy and, and medical world. Now we are making changes. Over in the substance abuse arena, we get to ask these questions because it's part of the mental health aspect. We get to speak with the therapist and go, hey, this patient has chronic pain and a lot of stress that's occurring. We get to share information. We get to work together to help the patient understand, hey, listen, if you, if you do not appreciate how this pain is or how you're able to work with your anxiety and your stress, your pain is going to get worse and then you're not going to be able to uh, go to work or manage your relationships. So working together with this multidisciplinary approach team has been phenomenal. And what we're doing now with chronic pain patients, we have patients that have cystic soft, you know, they speak for themselves. We have patients that have been in opiates for 20 years. We have patients on MAT programs for 10 years. Yeah, they have a rough detox and they have trouble at the beginning, but yeah, the brain is healing. But patients are going back and, and functioning without opiates. Patients that believe that there's no way I could do anything because I have all these chronic 
diseases and all this stuff that's going to happen. It's so bad. People, people are reversing some of these things. Diabetes, which used to be a death sentence. We're able to reverse diabetes with proper diet and exercise and changing your thought process, going, improving your health and sleep. Literally, you're able to reverse type 2 diabetes. Okay? So if you have type 2 diabetes or you're, or you're pre-diabetic, you have a fast pass to get heart disease or cancer and die. But you can do something about it. And a lot of it has to do with your mental health. Working with a mental health practitioner, as well as some of the people that do all the physical work, is extremely important. That's how we make these changes. Therapists by themselves will not do it. Mental health practitioners by themselves will not do it. We have to use about this approach. And it's amazing with the results that we see. Now, here's some of the pain neuroscience stuff. Therapeutic alliance uh, and, and um, motivational interviewing uh, are the two of the big words that you're going to read in that. Uh, a lot of you guys probably do some of this stuff just innately, um, but there's science behind it and, and defends it. So when for us in, in the community or if somebody that's going to work with your patients that has substance abuse, the drug use history is extremely important. Depending on if they have alcohol or opiates or whatever drug use that they were using because the body will respond different ways to different things with inflammation. Stress and sleep, we take these questions extremely serious. We, we delve deep into them. We want to know how much sleep you've been getting is it you're having trouble falling asleep or staying asleep? There's a difference. If you are sleeping, are you actually able to dream? If you're dreaming, you're having REM sleep. If you're not having any dreams whatsoever, your brain's actually never going to rest. Therefore, you'll be completely stressed and tired in the morning when you wake up. Hometown, your current living situation, the socioeconomic status, what's occurring, what you're around, what that will cause a huge part of stress. How many facilities you've been? If this has been your 20th facilities, the 20th time you're in, in treatment versus your first time in treatment. Um, the person that's the first time around will be more anxious and willing to do way too much at the beginning and not appreciate that this is a marathon, not a sprint, versus the person that's been 20 times has feels hopeless. And, and we have to kind of give them that motivation and vigor for them to believe again and understand that they have power to be able to go back to this. Um, again, some of these questions, I'm not going to hit on every single one of them because there's a couple of things I want to hit at the end. Um, acupuncture is one of the biggest things that we're able to use. You guys can read all these things. Basically, makes everything better. Better. Um, every single one of these that I've put it in, um, ha we have significant statistical evidence and research that support all these things. Um, improved sleep, reduction in cravings, reduction in anxiety and emotional stress. These two right here alone, anxiety and emotional stress, and deep improved sleep, are enough to be able to address the um, chronic pain issue that we have. Um, these are some of the statistics. All right. This is some of the discussions I wanted to get to because these are real world answers. What else can we do besides some of the going to the therapist or having them to go to a chiropractor and move and do things more? We're going to talk about it right now. This is an anti-inflammatory diet. There is no diet. This actually, we should probably change the name from diet. Um, but there is no proper diet in my opinion. No diet works because if there was any diet that worked over the last 100 years, we would have known about it. But every diet that's been out there has ups and downs and just diets we know don't work. A lifestyle change or a lifestyle adjustment are important. Now, what we're going to talk about right now is what can we do to help when we are in pain? I'm not going to, we're not going to have a complete nutritional discussion because I don't have enough time to do that. But what we know is what we do with pain, right? So, a quick little thing, uh, look up um, nightshade vegetables, okay? Nightshade vegetables, so night, N-I-G-H-D, shade, S-H-A-D-E, vegetables, okay? If you look those up or if you know what they are, tomatoes, potatoes, white potatoes, green peppers, and eggplant, okay? Now, in Middle Eastern culture, we literally have a sandwich that has all of those tomatoes, white potatoes, eggplant, green peppers, paprika, and white bread. Okay. It is one of the most delicious things you've ever had in your life. If I have one of those within three seconds, I will have heartburn and I will become a dinosaur that spits out fire and my knees will literally inflame within seven minutes after ingesting that sandwich. It is the most delicious thing ever. Sometimes it is worth the pain. Okay. Most of the time it is not. All right. So here's the point of this. And that if you have pain already, okay, if you hurt your back, or you know you're already extremely stressed and you just walked around Disney and your knee's really swollen, or life has been really tough, you haven't slept really well, 
and something hurts or is affecting you. Eating food that is going to cause more inflammation, such as nightshade vegetables, is probably not the smartest thing. An eggplant parm pasta with, with white pasta, right, is not the smartest sandwich or meal that you should have. It will cause more inflammation, okay? Now, it does not mean that tomatoes are bad. It does not mean that green peppers are bad or any of the nightshade vegetables are bad. It's not about bad or good. It's about that they're, they actually have very positive effects in each one of those. However, we all agree and we all know that these things cause inflammation. So if you are already inflamed or if you're under a significant amount of stress and you have or things that are hurting, adding more inflammation to your body is not a good thing, okay? So these diet rules to live by are, you can live with them all that you want, doesn't really matter. However, it's really mainly for us when we are in severe pain, which are decreased inflammation, okay? This is one of the quickest ways for us to actually help get rid of inflammation. If you take ibuprofen, if you do ice, or if you do some of these Epsom salts or any of these things that do, we have significant evidence that say they don't do anything, they don't decrease inflammation. If I put ice on my knee that's swollen and my swelling doesn't go away, then I'm gonna continue having pain. I might be numb so they don't feel the pain. Yeah, but my swelling didn't go away. The ice is not decreasing inflammation. Anti-inflammatory meds, such as ibuprofen, Aleve and all this stuff, physically does not actually decrease inflammation. It stops the signal, just like opiates, from, to tell the body that, hey, there's an injury. The body doesn't send any more inflammation, but guess what? The reason you took them is because you're already inflamed. It does not allow the body to heal, okay? So eat more plants, okay? Green stuff, green plants. That's the best way to do this. Eat more plants, okay? Rules of thumb that we're going to have by there's five rules of them. Second one, eat, focus on antioxidants. Now, you cannot go to the, to the Publix and get antioxidant juice that's got 60 grams of sugar that's in it, right? That does not count, right? That's more sugar, which is more inflammation. Um, we used to have, oh, I should have changed this, but we uh, this focus on antioxidants and um, used to, actually we added a sixth one, which is stop eating sugar. You're an inflammatory response, okay? But antioxidants, uh, thinks red, red and blues, okay? Red and blues, uh, uh, raspberries, blueberries, simple red and blues fruits. Uh, eat omega-3s. Omega-3s you can find in fish, salmon, tuna, mackerel. Um, if you do not like fish, you can add a supplement. What's the best supplement? The cheapest one that has only omega-3s. Now, the exception is, is there's, uh, there's DHEA. Uh, most of the time, those come in with omega-3s. DHEA is good for brain health. Um, the best place to get them is the cheapest place. We're going to go to Walmart, Target, Costco, Sam's Club. The most basic kinds, it has only omega 3s and only DHA. That's it. Get that. If you're going to eat, if you don't want to do that and you're going to eat fish, once a week is enough. Um, one serving of, of salmon should be enough for the amount of omega 3s that we need. Um, this one, I was forced, or the clients have forced me over the last couple of months to change this. Um, so they have won me over because they've provided enough research and evidence to support this. And I'm always a believer that says, I am not. The word of God. I don't not, I'm not. Do not take my word for the word of God because it's definitely not that. It's just my opinion and just information that I get, and I try to present it to as many people as I can. Um, you take the information and you research it on your own. You do what you want with it. It's your responsibility, not mine. I'm just giving you information. You guys do with it what you want. It used to be eat no red meat, but I have been schmoozed over by the clients because they have provided significant evidence that tells us or significant incongruent evidence that tells us we don't really know if eating meat is bad, but we do know is if you eat too much red meat, it is bad, okay? Um, so we've changed it to eat less red meat to stop eating red meat. So they went for now. If there's more issues that comes up, we'll change it, but we're adaptable and flexible. Last one is cut the processed stuff. What that means is if you go to the grocery store, most grocery stores, all the processed foods are in the middle. So if you're, show, if you're going up and down the aisles, you're doing something wrong. Okay, especially if you're inflamed, if you have, and you, again, your back hurts, neck hurts, you've been stressed, you know you haven't been sleeping, do not shop up and down the aisles. The only exception is the deli because it's all the preservatives that's in there, right? So shop around the outskirts of the grocery store, you're doing fine, do your best to stay away from the middle aisle except for the water. All right, now, uh, I'm not gonna go too much into these. I, get, I put these on purpose. Oh, this is the last one I will talk about. Um, the next two slides are about natural painkillers. I have some essential oils up here, uh, some things that you guys can do. Natural muscle relaxers, 
chamomile tea, cherry juice. These are just a couple of things. Vitamin D, magnesium is also another one uh, for muscle relaxers. I'm going to leave these up because I think everybody gets this uh, presentation. So I wanted to give people information just in case I talk too much. Um, I did a huge pep mud, pep mud med study or um, research to figure out, wanted to look what was the biggest things to manage chronic pain without medication, right? Uh, I had a couple of my buddies also involved in this and wanted to go, hey guys, let's figure out what is the best thing that is out there that the research says um, is helping with chronic pain without medication. And here's what we found. And this was not biased uh, by us because physical therapy was actually number four. Regular exercise was the number one thing to be found and to be supported. Uh, integrative medicine, yoga, tai chi, acupuncture. Um, why? Because we tap into the mind-body connection, right? Um, stress management, physical therapy was number four. I thought we'd be higher than that, but it is what it is. At least we're on the list. And surprisingly, which I did not actually believe until I looked into this, laughing. Laughter was one of the best things that help people manage chronic pain, okay? Um, so I, this, if I, again, if we give this or if we use this and give this concept to our clients and say, hey, guys, here's what you should be doing and incorporating these things, it really makes sense. Now, this integrative med medicine one's interesting. The, um, so the yoga, tai chi, breath work community um, when got super excited and they got were pounding on their chest about a year ago. Uh, one of the bigger studies came out in mental health talking about if a client or if a person is in a fight or flight response or in, uh, immediately in a, in, a, in a, I feel like I'm in danger and they're in a fight or flight, CBT and DBT services or doing that while they're in a fight or flight response will not be effective. Okay. Now all the yoga people and all the breath work people are going, Oh yeah, we knew this all along. We've been telling you for 30 years, 50 years, you should deep breathe and all this stuff. Correct. Now we have evidence to support that. If a patient is in super fight or flight response, extremely anxious, okay, doing CBT and DBT, it, it's almost a waste of time. The, the benefits of it will not have many, many effects, if any at all. However, after those patients did breath work and some yoga and got to normalize their fight or flight response, CBT and DBT had significant improvement and significant assistance in helping them with the symptoms that they were dealing with, right? So what does that tell us? In, in the practice, patients that are detoxing early on, we need to work with them on working on just breathing, right? Just simple breath work. Here's, actually, I think I said something back about how important stress is. This, if there's one thing, and this is really the one take home message that I want everybody to take, and it's the same thing we tell every single patient that walks in their door, We've stopped giving patients home exercise program on the first day. We used to give patients seven, eight, nine, ten exercises the first day they come see us because we thought our exercises were so amazing. Uh, what we're learning is mm, they're not really that awesome. Um, they make people feel better because they think they're feeling better because they think I'm awesome and I'm telling them information. That's really about it. Um, and it, literally, that's what it is. If the patient believes that I'm going to make them better, then they're going to feel better. The one thing that I want you guys to take away from this is an intentional deep breath. Okay, so when we take intentional breath in through your nose, out through your mouth, what we basically do is we take our nervous system when it's hyperactive and it's pissed off and it's going, oh, I'm in danger, I'm in danger. We take it and we just give it a timeout. Okay, an intentional deep breath will give you a timeout. So if you're in that fight or flight response, you're super stressed, you're super anxious, just taking that one intentional deep breath will start giving yourself a break, right? Now, it's not going to make it all better, but you're at least giving yourself a break. We ask clients to do at least one an hour. That's nothing. That's one an hour. You breathe as a reflex. That doesn't count, right? But it's when we take in this intentional deep breath, which our understanding is I'm decreasing my nervous system, not allowing my nervous system to take over. I'm letting it calm down. And it literally does. We have enough evidence now to support this. When, my, when I'm decreasing my nervous system down and now I'm calm, I'm not in danger, then I can go and do all my techniques that I've learned when I was in treatment and all the, my CBT and CBT work. And then I'm actually going to see some results. Um, so these natural pain and muscle relaxers are there. Um, therapeutic alliance. So again, this is all the stuff that we are learning from our evidence that we're doing. So when practitioners who attempted to form a warm and friendly relationship with their patients, we assured them that they would soon be better. We're trying to be more effective than practitioners who get their consultation in personal, formal, and uncertain. We don't tell them 
that, hey, you're going to be better. You're going to be awesome. We're going to be like, listen, we're going to do everything that we can to make you feel better. Right. And that's really just getting a relationship with them. When we have these questions that we were talking earlier about with therapeutic clients and motivational interviewing, again, the mental health community is probably a lot farther along than the medical community when it comes to med- motivational interviewing. Um, so uh, props to you guys. Um, but this, again, this is in 2001. This is a 20 year old study and still talked about and still presented. We have to do this. More people are not doing this. The days of doctor visits for 10 minutes or three minutes in and out. This is why we have an issue with our problem. Again, collaboration work support between therapist and patient. Okay. The patient that we had retention and participation, all the exercises, psychotherapy, mental health services, and addiction recovery. These are the highest medical field, medical practice or medical fields that have the most amount of patient retention participation. This exactly explains with these three things, we are very close and compassionate with the mental health community, with our patients, right? That's why they can continue coming back. That's why we get good positive results with them. Their the definition of therapeutic alliance and motivational interviewing is in the mental health community. Agreeing with the patient, having an understanding and really developing what the real goal is that we want. Getting out of pain is not the answer, okay? As a matter of fact, a lot of times what we are doing now and we're learning is to not ask patients about pain. We don't ask, hey, what's your pain like today? Because guess what? If you talk about pain, you're going to think about pain. We don't ask that. We go, hey, how are you feeling today? Are you in a good mood today? Did you accomplish something that you wanted to accomplish today? Those are real answers because that is what quality of life is really centered around. But if we continue focusing on pain, 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 all we're going to talk about is pain, then all we're going to feel is pain. And pain is a perception. It's a feeling, right? It's a perception about a feeling that we have. It's not even a real feeling, right? So if we're able to adjust and modify that and educate the patients and talk about goals that are realistic, maybe the realistic goal is not to be 100% out of pain. You might have some discomfort that you're going to have to deal with, but your quality of life will improve. And if you would say that to our patients, hey, I'm going to make your quality of life significantly better, yeah, you still might be in pain, but you're able to do everything that you want to do. Pretty awesome results. We got to communicate both the expectations um, between, for the practitioner and the client. They have to know what we expect of them. Okay, and one of the things that we tell our patients, hey, listen, I'm going to promise you that I'm going to do everything I can. I'm going to see you as many times as I can physically possibly can to give you all my effort. But for me to do that, I need to, you to give me two breaths a day or an hour, every single day, every single time. If they know that, they feel like, oh, I got to breathe and he's going to help me. That's pretty sweet. That's awesome. Now they know what my expectations are of them. Now the breath work is in there. It's important and they know what I need out of them. They do the same with us. Placebo. We're not going to get too much into it just because we don't have enough time. But what we do know is every single drug in the United States that is approved by the FDA had a placebo score that's less than 20%. If you, when you go to the FDA and say, hey, I want to get approved for this medicine that I'm having or selling, and it's more than 20% placebo, more than 20% of the population the placebo work for, you cannot, your drug does not get approved, okay? But that means that every single drug out there in the United States right now had a group that when they went through, some people took a placebo or sugar pill and it got better. Every single drug. That means there's some cancer patients that went in thinking that they're gonna get the cancer med and they actually got a sugar pill and their cancer went away, okay? Let that sink in for a second. Heart disease, every single medicine that's out there, insert name here, okay? Now, some are better than others, right? But every single drug has a placebo, a percentage of placebo of the patients that take the placebo and they get better. Placebo is one of the most powerful things. If we could, Dr. Duncan would just let me do sugar pills, it'd be awesome, Um, but I don't think she's gonna let me. Anyway. Um, again, more research here on cervical, shoulder, and lumbar spine um, uh, manipulations. When patients, um, we, I'll do this one really quick. Patients, the perception of the, the practitioner is more important than what that practitioner actually does. This is what we learned from all these things. Um, I was part of the study when I was in PT school. Uh, as new grads or uh, last semester, you would have known how to manipulate the neck and upper back. Uh, versus we compared them with the new grad, the, uh, the first semester students that did not really know how to do it. They kind of just had a simple practice for about 10 minutes. The new grad would walk into the patient's room and they would have a lab coat, shirt, and tie. 
and they would perform the, the um, manipulation, manipulate their neck or the upper back. Then uh, a graduating student would come in, purposely have the shirt disheveled. Um, if you, I didn't shave at the time, um, and you would walk in and you would do the same exact thing. Now, my skill set is significantly higher and better to perform the manipulation than a new grad student. However, 80% of the time, the patient said the person that had the shirt and tie in the lab coat felt better and they felt like they got an improvement in their symptoms. My goodness. That means it doesn't even matter what I am. I just have to wear a shirt and tie and look like I know what I'm talking about and you're going to think I'm awesome and you're going to feel better, right? Now, there's very small things that are different. Um, there's some small manipulations in the neck, really three of them. Uh, there's two in the spine. Uh, one half of the joint in the shoulder, which is the bottom and back half, that are important that will make a difference with the practitioner experience and, and quality of their skill, uh, but the rest does not matter. Um, again, all these things I have in here for you guys, uh, this is just talking about the provider, if the provider believes, or the patient, again, believes that the provider is going to have their best interest in mind. This is the second to last thing that we have here. 24 million Americans are dependent on alcohol and drugs, okay? However, only 2 million of these people are receiving treatment. I think all of us are here because we are believe that we're here to serve for a purpose. Uh, I've made it my goal in my life and my career to end suffering when it comes to pain. I don't believe patients should suffer. You should not have to suffer with your pain. Um, it, it's not okay, it's not appropriate. It does not matter what kind of pain you have. We're something that we can do to help manage it. Um, we should be able to get to every single one of these people. There's 24 million people that are dealing with this and only 2 million. That's just, that's that's a lot of people that we need to get out there and help. Um, try to spread, if you guys can spread this message to anybody, right? Be breathe, intentional deep breath, one an hour. That is enough that we're gonna begin at least putting a small little dent in some of this stuff. Um, the last thing I'll talk about is we, I, I should have had this a little bit earlier with the, all the stuff that we had right after the diet discussion. Um, if there's five things that it's my belief that if we do uh, all as humans, um, we will get stronger and we'll be significantly better. Posture re-education, which means stand up straight. What grandma used to tell us with just pulling your head up, getting tall is, is perfect. Um, we know that when you walk into an interview, and you are standing with uh, chin up a little bit and your, and your chest is erect, that your chances of getting the interview are 33 better than the next person. Posture chain strengthening is basically anything that when you're standing in the mirror and looking is all the muscles that you don't see. So not your chest, not your abs, not your quad, um, not your calves, right? It's, and not your biceps. It's all the ones in the back of your body, uh, from back of your head down to your heel. Those are the ones that we should be strengthening, not the ones that we can see in the mirror. Thoracic and pelvic mobility. Thoracic is your upper back. Most of us sit most of the time. So your thoracic spine gets really, really stiff, moving that as well as your pelvis. Core strengthening. Your core is from the middle of, it's right underneath your sternum to the middle of your pelvis. So if you put your hands there, underneath your sternum, the middle of your pelvis, if your hands are coming together, you're not strengthening your core. If your hands are staying apart, you're doing exercise that's strengthening your core. So if you're doing crunches, they're not strengthening your core. They're actually making your spine worse. If you're doing a plank or you're doing anything where your legs are moving, but your core from underneath your sternum to the middle of your pelvis is not coming together, and you're keeping that straight, that's how you're doing core strengthening. And then finally, a deep squat. This one is one of the most important things. Maybe I could give everybody two things to go home with. Breathe, intentional deep breath, two an hour, and a deep squat. A deep squat basically is when you squat ass to grass, right? So sit, try to go down as low as you can, keep your heels on the ground. If you look at a two-year-old, three-year-old, four-year-old, they're able to sit and play like that for hours on end. Western culture, Eastern culture, uh, a lot of times they don't have toilets in their homes or in the communities. So they have to squat down and go to the bathroom. Um, they have the least amount of total knee replacements in the entire world, least amount of total hip replacements in the world, least amount of pain, back pain, back surgery in the world, and the least amount of C-sections in the entire world, mainly because the deep squat is part of their normal everyday life. Um, they squat to go to the bathroom. They squat to eat. Deep squatting is one of the most important things. It's a movement that we have forgotten to do because we sit too much. And for the last hour and a half, we were all sitting. I apologize. Usually I tell everybody to stand. I completely forgot because I got really excited with all this stuff.
and I think I just got it one o'clock. Yes, I never finish on time. Miss Beth Ann, I am done. Guys, there's references back here. If you want anything else, um, please reach out. This is the information of all the people's. Um, Brandon, I think you were going to want to say something at the end as well. I don't know if I have to unmute anybody or not. Yeah, before turning it over to um, Beth Ann, I just wanted to thank everyone again. And thank you, Dr. Ahmed, uh, for taking time out of your day. You, uh, you did an amazing job. This was a wonderful presentation. So just thank you all again. We appreciate the support. And thank you, Ahmed, for your time um, very much. And I'll, I'll turn it over to Beth Ann for, for closing. All right. Thank you, Brandon. Ahmed, if you wouldn't mind um, stopping sharing your screen. All right. Well, thank you, Dr. Ahmed. Um, let's give him a virtual round of applause. And again, thank you for taking the time out of your day. Ahmed is such a huge part of what we do at Futures, and I know our clients would consider him to be one of the best in the world for sure. So thank you. And for everyone that participated today, your CEU certificates are going to be emailed to you next week at the email address that you registered with at. And I am going to be launching a brief anonymous survey, if you wouldn't mind filling that out today so that we can get some experience about your um, feedback about your experience. And as Brandon said, if you do have any additional questions or comments about today, you can reach out to him. And of course, you can always reach out to me as well. So with that, I am going to launch the survey. And once you guys have done that, you're free to hop off. So thank you for joining us. Do we answer questions now? I see somebody that hand raised. Was that before or after? Hopefully that wasn't a long time ago. I, um, I believe that was before. Okay. Yeah, that was before. Since we're we're out of time here now, they can email those questions to us. I'm in. We'll Sweet. make sure you Sounds get good. those. Yeah, we'll make sure you get those and we can get that out. And I will also be sending out a copy of Ahmed's information today to your email addresses as well.